good evening fourth year students here's your lecture in literary criticism titled Horus and Longinus you know that you are still on the classical period uh, what Horus and Longinus are going to be the last uh, literary figures uh, that you are going to study for this period we, s we have already studied Plato and Aristotle and now uh, we are going to see Horus and Longinus Horus actually is um, is Roman uh, we, we know uh, actually good information about him uh, but Longinus is actually uh, we are not very sure about his birthplace and his origin whether he's Roman whether he's Greek but we are uh, mainly focused on his contribution to literary criticism so we are going to see that with those these two uh, figures we are going to end the classical period in criticism Horace and Longinus and we are going to start with with Horace so what do we need to know about Horace Horace was a friend of the Roman Emperor Augustus you remember this we have already mentioned him when we studied poetry last year and I told you that uh, the, the 16th uh, sorry the 17th and 18th century almost 18th century of the English poetry sometimes it's called Augustan why and you remember I explained this to you last year I told you that because the period in which the Roman Emperor Augustus was living was ruling it was a period of very uh, let's say uh, flourishing uh, period of literature so it was very similar to the English period of poetry that's why some some critics some historians refer to that English period as Augustine referring to this Emperor Augustus so we are going to see now that Horace lived in this time and actually he was very close to this Emperor he was a friend of him and in that period actually those people who were uh, like scholars teachers like Horace uh, they were hired in order to teach the sons and children of the wealthy people of the emperors okay the aristocratic people that's why someone like Horace was really close to the emperor Horace articulated what became the official canon of literary taste during the Middle Ages. Notice here, I told you also before that Horace actually has a great influence. Uh, not only great, wide influence actually. It started from his time, which is BC, and it continued to the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and through much of the New Classical period. هي احنا نسميها القرن الثامن عشر تذكرون من الاسماء اللي انطيناها هي قلنا ممكن نسمي اوغستن ايج ايج اوف ريزن نيو كلاسيكال ايج sometimes is referred to this uh, the 18th century okay uh, so this is the influence actually of Horace it started from his time and it continued why is it so uh, that Horace is so influential actually the his practical method was really uh, popular for the writers in all these periods okay okay so let's see what his uh, method is like uh, there is kind of comparison okay here between Horace and the previous ones that we have studied Plato and Aristotle whereas both Plato and Aristotle decree that poets must and do imitate nature again we have the idea of imitation once again Horace declares that poets must imitate other poets particularly those of the past so this is the difference between Horace and Plato and Aristotle both Plato and Aristotle believe that art is imitation Horace says that actually yes it is an imitation he also thinks that it is imitation but it should be an imitation of other poets other great poets who have written the best literature and as a writer if a writer wants to be a good writer he should imitate those poets especially those of the past why because they have created they have written the best literature that could be written okay so the writer should follow their example in order to be a good writer what else Horace was more practical notice this word practical what does it mean to be practical it means that he 
doesn't give what theories instead of giving theories like for example Plato or Aristotle he would devise a list of direct instructions of what to do and not to do in order to write a good piece of literature so instead of giving theories and uh, theorizing actually about writing literature why not give direct instructions straightforward instructions to writers do this and don't do that write in this way and don't write in that use this technique don't use that technique you see so he was very direct and straight in giving the instructions to writers this is what makes him different from Plato and Aristotle you remember Plato has a theory Aristotle also gave definitions he was speaking theoretically about tragedy right but here with Horace now we have practical criticism we have a list of instructions what to do and what not to do okay to be considered a good writer he maintains Horace of course one should write about traditional subjects in novel ways so don't come up with new subjects as a writer you are not required to bring new subjects no you can bring traditional subjects old ones and write about them in a new way okay so you are not supposed to bring any new subjects in your writing you have to bring traditional why again this is the same idea that the the writers of the past have written the best subjects the best literature so your job as a writer is to uh, get these subjects again in your writing and what try to just to improve the way maybe or something new about your style in writing but still the subjects are the same as the traditional ones the poet should avoid all extremes in subject matter word choice vocabulary and style it means that you have to be very precise in choosing your words your vocabulary your style don't use excessive for example images excessive uh, device rhetorical devices you have to choose the words which really express what you want to say uh, so you see uh, here Horace is really uh, giving direct uh, instructions to writers do this and don't do that gaining this ability one should read the works of ancient Greeks so how can you be able to write precisely in, the, in, this, in this way or to choose your vocabulary to have a good style how can you achieve this or how can you gain this ability according to Horace you can do that by what read the works of ancient Greek and Roman writers like for example Homer so if in, in order actually this is does does make sense if you want to imitate the, the poets and writers of the past what you should do you have to read their works <coughs> okay you should read the works of the ancient Greek and Roman writers uh, the great ones and also uh, try to learn from them okay for example notice here this example since authors of antiquity means that the past writers began their epics in the middle of things all epics must begin in Medias res this term is actually I think it's Greek and it means to start the action in the middle uh, and you remember I gave you examples of some novels sometimes plays works of literature in which the events the action starts in the middle and then the, the, the speaker or the characters give us flashback to things which happened in the past and then tell us about things that uh, would happen in the future okay or the story continues goes on to the future but this technique or example says Horace that if the writers of the ancient epics uh, wrote uh, their epics starting from the middle of the action so you as a writer you should follow the same technique the same way the same style okay above all writers should avoid appearing ridiculous and must therefore aim their sights low not attempting to be a new Virgil or a new Homer 
okay you are supposed to imitate those writers okay but try not to think that you can come up with your own thoughts or ideas so you can sum up this point here writers should avoid being original you are not supposed to give <coughs> original ideas or original stories uh, you, you are supposed to imitate great writers like Virgil like Homer but you could you can't come up with new topics or so stories or subjects just like they did okay you have to what according to Horace aim your sight low as a writer okay don't attempt to be original you should only imitate other writers <coughs> Literature's ultimate aim is to teach and delight at the same time. So finally, you can say, say that uh, Horace gave us this statement that for literature, the ultimate aim is to teach something, but it should entertain at the same time. You remember Plato and Aristotle, each one of them said something about this point. <clears throat> According to Plato, literature should only teach and if it doesn't teach anything, it is useless. According to Aristotle, actually, the literature is for enter uh, entertainment. People like to be entertained by stories. But here with Horace, we see that he joined both ideas together. Okay, so this is Horace. We said he's more practical <clears throat> than the other uh, critics. What about Longinus? We said Longinus actually, we said we don't know many information about him concerning his birthplace, whether he's Greek or Roman. We're not sure actually. We, we don't have enough information. So some say he's Greek, others say he's Roman. And he lived in the first century AD, the first uh, century. What is his contribution? His remarkable contribution to literary history is his treatise on the sublime. So pay attention. I hear, I think I forgot to mention uh, the book that was written by Horace. Let me write it for you here. It is called Ars Poetica or in English The Art of poetry this is Horace's book okay this is from which we have taken all the information about him so this is Ars Poetica or of course it's in Latin but in English it's called the art of poetry for Longinus what is the title it's on the sublime the word sublime here is important what does he mean by the sublime Longinus often appear uh, so see, sorry peppers his Greek and Latin writings with Hebrew quotations, making him the first literary critic to borrow from a different literary tradition. So the first example that we have of a writer who would writes in different languages and he borrows quotations from another tradition, from another culture, another language, is with Longinus. He's the first one that we have ever uh, recorded. And in, in literature, what do you call this? and earning him the right to be called the first comparative critic in literary history. So writing in such way means that the writer here is compar comparing between, as if there is comparison between different cultures, different languages. So this is what we call what comparative literature, comparative critic, he's the first one to have done such a thing in his writing. So the first thing we know about Longinus that he is the first comparative critic in literary history. Why? Because in his writings we find Greek and Latin and at the same time we have Hebrew quotations. Unlike Plato, Aristotle and Horace, notice here again we have comparison between uh, Longinus and the previous ones that we have studied. So what makes him different? Longinus concentrates on single elements of a text and he is the first critic to define uh, a literary classic. Okay, so what makes him different? Look, notice here, 
he concentrates on single elements of a text what does this mean it means that for example when we were studying plato remember we noticed that plato is actually more concerned or focused in the content of our uh, literary work whether it is good or not whether it is useful to people whether it, it uh, destroys them this was the concern of plato when we came to Aristotle, we noticed that actually he was more interested in what? Interested in the form of the literary work. So you notice each one of them takes a single or let's say just one element and consider that this is the important element. With Horace, again, it is the, the literary taste. Uh, so with Longinus, what's different is that he thinks that actually all the elements are important so he focuses on each one of them single he takes a single element and he focuses on it how to write it or how to uh, form this uh, element whether it is related to the content to the language to the form so each element actually is important with Longinus and he gives a focus or a, 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 let's say concentration on each single element alone but finally all of them are important okay and he was also the first critic to define a literary classic and what do we what do you mean by literary classic okay let's make this correct or what what defines a literary classic according to Longinus first it is timeless it doesn't belong to a certain time it could be read at any time whether it was in the time it was written, whether in other time in the future, okay? Memorable. The ideas, the themes, the story is really something that people, when they read, they can relate to and they can't forget it. Something that actually is immortal, we can say. Uh, so these are the defining characteristics for a literary classic. And he was the first one to give a definition of such a thing. Yani, what are the works of literature that when we look at this work, we say this is a literary classic. It should have these characteristics. Okay. The key concept in Longinus is sublimity. Remember the title on the sublime. So here sublimity has something to do with uh, the greatness of the text. Let's see what he means by this word. By the word sublime, you notice this is a noun this is this, the adjective Longinus means elevation or loftiness something really high really elevated all that which raises a style above the ordinary and gives to it distinction in its widest and truest sense so any element which contribute to the greatness of the text the elevation the loftiness of the text this is what we call sublimity sublime the text should be sublime so how can the sublimity be achieved sorry there was a line here both nature and art so here you see wh where does it come from the sublimity it comes from nature and art two things here we have both of them contribute to sublimity in literature how can nature and art contribute to sub sublimity according to Longinus Notice here, Longinus finds five principal sources of the sublime. So he defined five main sources, okay, of the sublime. The first two of which are largely the gifts of nature. You see, so we have certain elements which come from nature, other elements come from art. What does this mean? What are these two uh, elements which come from nature or are the gifts of nature? First, grandeur of thought. And remember I told you it means that the writer should be, what? Should have great ideas. Uh, he should be genius. He should be talented. Okay. And talent and genius are gifts of nature. I mean, they, they can, can't be acquired. These things, they are not acquired. They are gifts of nature either you have the talent the ability to write or not either you are genius or not either you have great thought or not so this is something that is granted to you as a writer from nature this is not something that you can acquire the other thing is capacity for strong emotion also 
what motivates you or what gives you the passion to write that you have certain feelings certain emotions that you want to express so these two elements notice are what according to Longinus the gifts of nature they come from nature naturally they are innate okay they are innate let me write this word for you يعني بالفطرة أشياء توجد عند الإنسان بالفطرة innate innately you don't acquire them they should be found uh, in you naturally okay what about the other three gifts that should the writer have they are related to art see the other three uh, sources of sublimity comes from art come sorry from art what are they appropriate use of figures so as a writer you should be able to use figures of speech rhetorical devices you should know how to use them how to employ them in your text okay this is something that's related to language to the artistic part of language nobility of diction it means that you have, you should have the ability to choose the exact and the um, the suitable words for your writing for your uh, piece of literature what are the words that you should use in your poem for example you should exactly know what are, what are they five dignity of composition it means what it means finally now that you have all the elements together you should be able to write a text or a composition which is what which is coherent which is all the elements are fitting with each other each element in its place see final result should be what should be a very good composition or a happy or a good synthesis of all the elements that we have mentioned the five sources the five elements should all be combined together in order to create uh, a good text okay uh, a coherent composition okay this is concerning Longinus so you, you notice here that Longinus actually created some kind of a balance here between all the elements the previous ones you remember each one of them focused on just one element but with Longinus we see that he tried to reach to a certain balance between all these different elements two of them are from nature and the other three should be the gifts of what of art as a writer you should have the uh, artistic ability in order to achieve these things okay so this was our lecture for Horace and Longinus and you remember all the time if you have any question related to the subject you can ask in our group in telegram thank you very much